All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mandy Goodset and I'm a librarian at Cleveland State University and this event's planning committee co-chair. And I'd like to welcome you to the final keynote for OpenCon Cleveland 2021. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the original custodians of the various lands on which we work today, including those on the land where I sit, such as the Shawnee, Miami, Erie, Ottawa, Potawatomi, and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We pay our respects to indigenous leaders past and present uh, and emerging, and we recognize and celebrate the diversity of indigenous peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the land on which we live. I encourage all to learn more about the native people in their own communities who have continued to steward these lands throughout generations. Thank you all so much for joining us for our fourth annual OpenCon Cleveland event. This is our first time offering it virtually. Uh, we're thrilled to be able to offer this event again and that we have a whopping 300 registrants this year, which is amazing. Uh, whether this is your first OpenCon Cleveland or your fourth, we hope that this has been an informative and fruitful event for you so far. Our OpenCon Cleveland Planning Committee worked really hard to put, put together a program and speakers we thought would help you move your efforts to promote open education on your own campus forward. Very briefly, I just wanna explain why we're called OpenCon Cleveland. Um, OpenCon is actually an international organization that celebrates open access, open data, and open education, and it focuses on new professionals. They offer an annual international conference as well as a lot of other really useful community supports. Um, but because that conference is international, not everyone can attend. So they encourage and support OpenCon satellite events like this one organized by Cleveland State University. If the topic of open education interests you, I would encourage you to check out the International OpenCon Organization. Um, I do have some housekeeping details to share with you, but if Provost Zhu is here, let me just check. Don't see him here. When he arrives, he's got some uh, welcoming remarks to give us. Um, so before we do that, I just want to remind you, if you are sharing anything about this event on social media and would like to use our hashtag, it's on the screen there. It's OpenCon 2021 Cleveland. And we are recording this session today and we'll post it in Slack later. So you'll be able to view it and share it with your colleagues after the event. The Slack space will remain up indefinitely after the event. So feel free to continue to have conversations there. Um, do note that we'll no longer be actively monitoring uh, that space after today. And our speakers may or may not check in there. Um, so feel free to use it for your own dialogue with folks. And I'm sure you can reach out to our speakers as well if you have additional questions just via email. Um, this year, in an effort to get folks chatting in our Slack space, we offered to enter everyone who participated in our social channels into a drawing for a $25 gift card. Please stick around until the end of this keynote to learn who our winner is. And if you'd like another chance to win a gift card, we are um, anyone who completes our post-event survey will be eligible to win a $25 gift card for that as well. And we'll send that out in Slack and via email after this event. It's really helpful to us for improving our event going forward, especially since this is a very different format than we've normally done. And most of us on the committee were really getting used to Slack um, as an option. And so we'd really love to hear what you think of it and if you found it engaging. Um, before we introduce our wonderful speaker, I just want to take a moment to thank this year's planning um, event planning committee members, Barb Loomis, Marsha Miles, Ben Richards, Laura Ray, Melanie Gagich, and Heather Capret. Putting events on like this requires a lot of work, a lot of energy for anyone who's ever done it. And they have done a great job of putting together a, an event that's uh, valuable to attendees. So please join me in giving them a virtual round of applause. Um, I also want to thank the Cleveland State University's Michael Schwartz Library for sponsoring our keynote speaker and the Center for eLearning for sponsoring our prizes at today's event. I'm going to just do one more check to see if Provost Zhu made it. I don't see him. And that's okay because that will leave us time for more questions. So without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Ben Richards to introduce our keynote speaker. Thanks, Mandy. 
Uh, so I'm really happy to introduce our keynote speaker, who is Regina Gong. Regina is the Open Educational Resources and Student Success Librarian at Michigan State University. Regina is actively involved in the open education community and has done numerous national presentations, webinars, and workshops on OER, open education, open educational practices, and women of color in OER. Regina currently serves in the Open Education Conference Steering Committee, Spark Open Education Advisory Group, and she serves as faculty for the Association of American Colleges and Universities Institute for Open Educational Resources. Regina also provides leadership to the statewide Michigan OER Network, a community of practice and a coalition of OER advocates across K through 20 in Michigan. She is a recipient of the OER Research Group Fellowship and a Global OER Graduate Network member. Regina obtained her master's in library and information science at Wayne State University and is currently pursuing a PhD in higher education at Michigan State University. Uh, she will now give her keynote presentation, which is titled Straddling in the Middle, Librarians as Connectors Between Students and Educators. Thanks, Regina. Thank you, Ben. And bear with me here as I do my screen sharing. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you everyone for spending your Friday afternoon attending this um, keynote of mine. And I am coming from, not in Ohio, <laughs> but here in Okemos, Michigan, which is um, five minutes away from MSU campus, which is um, in East Lansing. So while we meet today in a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous, the, the importance of the indigenous people with which um, inhabits are the land that we call home. And um, with this land acknowledgement, I hope we can take action to support our indigenous peoples. So first of all, I would like to thank the um, organizers of OpenCon 21 Cleveland. This is my first time to, to attend this um, gathering. And so I'm really um, grateful that you asked me to be your um, keynote speaker. So thank you. Thank you, Mandy. I know, and, and all of you, I know it's not easy to mount an online virtual conference and have you know, all the participants engage. So thank you. Thank you to the good work that you are doing. Okay, so I have two screens. So bear with me as I like look here and look there. <laughs> um, so what I will be talking about this, this afternoon is informed by the work that I do as a librarian and as an OER program leader, first at a community college. So I used to work in a community college for nine years and I started the OER program there. So that's Lansing Community College. And now um, I am in, in an R1 institution in a land grant institution such as MSU. I'm sorry, there's train passing by. So if you hear the, the train, I, I apologize. <laughs> So um, in all the keynotes that I have done so far, I really, really like to tell stories. And so if you like to hear a story or stories about the journey that I have um, traversed in the past year, connecting with our faculty, our educators and our students, um, I hope you find value, value in that, because I am really excited to, sh to share with you that experience. And I also am excited to share with you my hopes for the future as we all do the work that um, on, on open education and OER. Okay, so as you all know, last year, the middle of March, 
COVID-19 and the pandemic ravaged the US and the world, right? The world literally was at a standstill and our lives were appended. So many, so many deaths and distraction came about. And at the time when we started working from home, so that's March 16, 2020, I was just on my eighth month at MSU. So I started July 19, 2019. And at the time when we all worked from home, I was on my eighth month. But fortunately, I was able to um, have that connection, so to speak, with our faculty, with our students, with our administrators, with, that, with our academic staff, before we even um, had to pivot from you know, working from home. And so in that way, I am really fortunate that I was able to do that. So as you all know, with, with the pandemic and the move to, to online learning, it has intensified the need for digital learning materials. And a lot of us in the library, certainly at, at MSU, had to wrap up um, scanning of, of our, uh, of our um, course materials. So we have a course reserves um, at, at MSU where we buy um, copies of textbooks. But when we moved online, of course, those print cannot be uh, borrowed anymore. And so we had to um, actively scan those materials in order to provide our faculty with the needed um, course materials that they can use for, for their classes. And, and to me, as the OER librarian at MSU, it all the more intensified the need for OER. And so, uh, like what I said, prior to, to the move online, I have already started that connection with our faculty and with our students. So I wasn't really starting from scratch. So I called this planting the seed on campus because really that's what we do right in all the interactions that we have with our students with our faculty we are planting that seeds and hoping right hoping that it will bloom at the right time and grow so um like what i said i've done a number of trainings prior to the move online done a lot of trainings, talked to a lot of faculty in department meetings, certainly talked to a lot of administrators. And, and interestingly, three weeks before um, the work from home situation, we just awarded, um, how many faculty did we award our first? Okay, we awarded 10 um, faculty with an OER grant. Which, is, which represents our, the first round of, of OER awards that we um, have given at, at MSU. So the OER um, advisory committee met and awarded 10 applications to this, this faculty. So in our, in our kick of training for, for the faculty that, that we awarded this, this grants, we had to do it online because we can't meet face to face anymore. So here, so my, my talk centers around us librarians serving as connectors, right? Connectors to our students, and connectors to our educators or our faculty. So let's start with that connection to our faculty. Okay, this is very familiar to you, right? These are just some of the things that we do as librarians and as experts in OER. But this is not an exhaustive list. You know, the things that you find there, we do more. We do more than that. And while this represents our um, expertise, our knowledge and training as information professionals, I think we should go beyond 
offering our expertise to faculty. You know, of course, they need to know what we can offer them, but I think as we engage um, with them, we need to um, we need to communicate that we need to have that crucial conversation and like that getting to know each other before we can even offer the expertise that we have um, with regards to OER. So I am really all about connections. So, um, you know, whether that is just a cold call or a cold email or meeting um, a faculty for coffee or a walk around campus, I'm really all for that building a relationship before I even can sell, right, an OER to them. So in, in this regard, so we have a lot of strategies, right? We have a lot of strategies that we use to advocate for, for, for OER within our campus. And we might start with, um, presenting or doing trainings for faculty in departmental meetings or um, attending perhaps faculty senate meetings. But while those are important, you reach like a broad, right? A broad um, number of faculty. But, but in that setting, you really don't have that one-on-one -on -one connection, right? You, you really can't, get to know the faculty in a more in-depth way in that setting. And so while those are important, inviting them for a one-on-one one -on -one conversation is, I think, you know, crucially important. So what do, what do I do when, when I have that opportunity to have that meeting one-on-one? -on -one? Well, I start by asking questions. So these are just some of the questions that I ask. Certainly I don't have like a list in front of me and I do like interview. No, it comes like organically, but I want you to know the things, the things that I keep in mind when I have that conversation with them. So I really am interested in knowing how did you come to be a teacher? How did you come to be an educator? What is your epistemological beliefs and perspectives? So epistemology, right, is nature of knowledge. How do you view knowledge creation? What is your teaching philosophy? Is knowledge um, for you contested? Is not... Are, how do you view your students as co-creators of knowledge, right? And so in that conversation, you might learn that the faculty really values the knowledge that the students come with as they enter the classroom. Because I really believe our students are not empty vessels. You know, they come in the classroom with their lived experiences, with the knowledge that they, they bring into the classroom setting. And so I am interested um, on how uh, the, the educator views knowledge and knowledge creation. And I also ask, what is your classroom like? Is your classroom fun? Right? How do you how do you engage with your students and how do you make them engage with each with each other? Describe your classroom situation. I really want to learn. And then, like also, also important to, to, to ask about the challenges that they see that their students are experiencing. So those are the broad questions that that hopefully can allow you to, to learn more about the teaching philosophy of the educator or the faculty that you are working with. And then I ask even more questions. So after that conversation about like, you know, teaching and learning and knowledge creation, that is where, this is when I introduce, you know, information 
or questions regarding course materials. How do you make decisions about course materials? And what have you been using as course materials? So do you have the agency to assign your own co course materials or is it determined by a committee? So this I see uh, a lot when I was uh, working at a community college because a lot of times, so faculty there are 90% adjuncts. So a lot of times they don't really have a say as to the course materials that they assign to, you know, to their students, because there's a committee that um, chooses that for them. And, and so it, you know, you have to adjust because then if that's the case, then you would have to approach the committee that decides you know, on the course materials. But at MSU, fortunately, um, faculty have more agency with regards to choosing their um, course materials. So to me, I think I see that as, as an advantage because then you can work with individual faculty to, to have them try an OER versus convincing like, 30 people, <laughs> right, to use OER for um, a class. So, you know, then you can, you can ask about how uh, course materials are, are chosen. And then, of course, it's not a one-way conversation. It's not. You also have to tell your story. And, and this is what I like. So much as you learn about their teaching philosophy, about their classroom dynamics, I also want to, 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 to let them know, how did I come to be in open education? How did I come to be working in the OER world? Maybe I, I also start, how did I become a librarian? <laughs> so yeah, so I, I tell them my story and then um, I tell them why do I believe open education can be a catalyst for change and why is it important, right? So I am not pitching in anything to them. I am telling them my own beliefs, my own views about why I think this is important. And then like, kind of like make the goals of your OER program inform what you do as an OER leader on campus. So this is your opportunity to, to tell them what are the goals of your OER program and what do you hope to achieve with those goals? Then I tell them, how do this impact our students? It might be the first time that they will be hearing about OER. And it also might be the first time that they will learn the impact that you know, it has on our students, both good and bad. And then how can our students le learn better and engage meaningfully, participate in knowledge creation through OER? So, so those are the things that, that I tell them, you know, with regards to my beliefs about open and openness and kind of like engage with them about how do they, what does open mean to them? So you can ask them that, that question as well. And then, and then after that, you can ask them, how can we work together? Are you open? How might, how might um, you incorporate open education, OER, in your work? And so that begins the conversation about how you can work together, collaborate together, and move forward. So you see what, I, what I'm getting here? It's, it's really important for us to have, to establish that relationship at the onset, because it is, it is really critical that we know, we know who we are working with and establish that, that relationship. Also, it's important 
how do we position ourselves when we connect with them? And this is what I mean by this. So most of the time, we position ourselves as supporter. So we provide support. We, pro we, we are a collaborator. And while that, while those two things are important, um, supporter, collaborator, I think, and I really believe it's a partnership. So it's a partnership because we both help each other create something new for our students. And this, this graphic really says it all because together you create something. And, and while educators, while faculty may be the content experts, because you know that's their disciplinary training and that's you know that's that has been their bread and butter we bring so much more to the project that it makes it hard for them to succeed without our help without us partnering with them and so i see it as as us being equal partners and we and we have to let them know that and that goes a long way i think in building trust and mutual respect okay so in the following slides <laughs> i am going to show you some of um faculty uh, what faculty wrote about the partnerships that we have um, forged. And this is not to be like, you know, tooting my own horn, right? I just want you to, to see how they perceived my partnership with them as equal. And so this is for um, Ayman and Saddam, who created the elementary Arabic OER, you really have to check this out. I will give you a URL for where um, you can find this. You know, the gratefulness and the tremendous help that we provided in order for them to, to have this published. And this is in press books. So this one is basic Hindi. And I'll let you read it. It always makes me feel uh, <laughs> warms my heart really to see you know the 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 words of appreciation that our faculty um tells us and how we you know and how we've helped them in in putting their project to completion and this is another one. This is from Julian Shambliss, who um, wrote Reframing BH. Okay, I am sharing this with you because I want you to know that um, faculty, even if they are the eminent scholars in their field, they really value what we do as librarians. But we have to tell them that we do more than just support them. This is hard work. And we bring to the table something that they don't have. That's why you know, it is very important that they engage with us, that they partner with us, and they, they see us as co-creators, right? of the knowledge that they are putting forth for our students. And this is our uh, Pressbook page. These are our latest titles. We have published, <laughs> so before the pandemic, we had two titles. And be, like between March up to maybe April of this year, we published eight more. Yeah, it's a lot. So check it out. That is the link to our um, the OER that we have published so far. So I really believe that uh, the OER program is more than just affordability. And I'm really, really cognizant of that 
that fact. So when I started at LCC in a community college, admittedly, cost, savings, and affordability is really what drove me to, 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 you know, to lead this OER project. And that is really the compelling reason <laughs> what, why our faculty have decided to use OER because they really want to eliminate that barrier of cost for our students. But as I matured in my uh, views and perspective about OER, I really come to realize that it's not just about um, cost savings. It's not just about affordability. And you can see that in the OER program goals that we have at, that we have at, at MSU. You can see um, the goals that we have set forth for us as we move this this program and make it sustainable so we not only we not only strive to reduce educational costs for our students but we want we are building a platform an infrastructure a support system that allows our faculty to engage in all the ways possible with oer so we also provide the technical support. It's actually a wraparound support that we that we provide faculty. So we have um, publishing. We have our own print on demand service. We we just hired a copy editor assigned um, to our OER program. We have an accessibility coordinator. We have someone who designs our cover images. Um, you know, help them with their press books uh, layout and all. So those are the things that that we offer um, our faculty, and not to mention the things that I offer in terms of um, you know open licensing, copyright, and all of those um, instructional design advice that I provide faculty. But more importantly, I'd like to highlight the last bullet where you can see there, engage faculty in new pedagogical models, right? That leverages the affordances of OER and open education. So to that end, I also launch an open educational um, practice and open education learning community. So we started this in fall 2020. So fall and spring um, semester. So it's a whole year program. And this is through our um, Office of the Provo Academic Advancement Network. So, you know, I propose a learning community for our faculty who are engaged with OER to learn how they can leverage the use of OER and apply it to their practices apply it to the classroom situation in ways that um, in ways that involve right involve students as co-creators of knowledge and so uh, so I facilitate that learning community and I ask one of my librarian colleague who is in the digital scholarship lab to co-facilitate with me. And we designed a curriculum based on, you know, uh, the resources out there on uh, open pedagogy. So we meet once a month for one and a half hours and for each meeting we design you know certain lessons engagement i invited uh, external speakers to talk to us about how they practice oep in their classroom really really a vibrant community so we have about 15 faculty who were part who are part of this uh, learning community so plus the two of us, there's 17 of us all in all. So we establish a community norm from the get go. Because it is important that you provide that space and a place by which all of you can engage with each other in a safe and open environment. 
So some of these are like, you know, maybe uh, so simple, be respectful, right? <laughs> Inclusive, understand different perspective. Listening is important more than engaging and just be open to learning with each other. And this is what we emphasize when we did this um, learning community that we all learn from each other and that there's no right or wrong way to approach openness in our classrooms and our educational practices. And so we also have these guiding questions that animated how we interact with each other through the whole year. So uh, we begin by articulating what are our hopes for education, particularly higher education. It cannot be that we are just complaining about what's wrong with higher education, and there's a lot of them, right? But we also have to have that problem solving and transformative goals of, of, of higher education. How can we transform our practices through this community that we are forming? So what vision do you work toward when you design your daily professional practices in and out of the classroom? So the out of the classroom is important because it's connected. Right? Learning doesn't just happen within the confines of the classroom. You also have to, to think about how you, you do it outside. And then, you know, I mentioned this earlier, how do you see the roles of the learner and the teacher? How do they intersect? How do they um, complement each other? And then what challenges do your students face in their learning environment? And how does your pedagogy address them? So those are the guiding questions that we have as we engage with each other. I am looking at my clock because I don't want to like uh, miss the opportunity to answer your questions and have us, um, you know, in a conversation. So all the work that we do are in our MSU Commons. So it's an open access platform that serves as our institutional repository as well. And so we put all our files in there as well as in Google Doc. You know, we have our, our shared Google Drive too. And we use Hypothesis, which is an online um, social annotation tool. So we require uh, our, our participants to have an MSU Commons account and also Hypothesis account because, and I will show you how we use it. So this is, okay, so this is the page for our open pedagogy group in MSU Commons. So we have that. And that is where we deposit all our materials or our documents and engage with each other. And then this is just, you know, our first group activity. Just give you an example. We let them annotate this web page, uh, which is the year of opens. What, what is open pedagogy? So this page has a number of folks, let me, yeah, okay. So that is the page that we let them annotate. So there's a lot of educators there who defined what is open pedagogy for them. And so we asked them to, to, to read all of these folks, you know, as they define open pedagogy, Mahabali is in here, Rajiv and Robin, you know, they defined open education. And we asked them, who among these folks, who among these folks resonate with you, right? And so they put that as part of the annotation and then we engage with each other. And then when we meet and come back for our monthly meeting, we talk about this. So the work isn't done within that one and a half hour meeting only, we do that before and then we engage with each other when we do go back. Uh, virtually, you know, for our monthly meeting. And I think that helps. So these are just some of 
what our faculty participants have have written about their experience with the community. And I know it's a lot. <laughs> I know it's a lot to read, but I put the things that I really liked. I mean, I like all of it, but I just bolded some of it for you to kind of like hone in on that. What is what I emphasize in our learning community is the reflexivity. So we always do a lot of reflection. As educators, as faculty, we probably don't have time to reflect on our teaching, right? And so I think it is important to have that intentionality in terms of reflecting on your experiences. And so we had them write this down. And this is what they say. Hopefully you've read some of it. So I'll go to the, the next one. It's like, I didn't know that, you know, my understanding of OER was so limited to this. And with the learning community has broadened my understanding. And I will continue to advocate and use OER. More likely than before. So that really is good. And then this one, hoping that OER and the and the, what they learned as critical educators, you know, in our community will help them design better learning experiences for their students. This one is like great opportunity for faculty. Yeah, with the same type of interest to be able to discuss the advantages of, of um, yeah, I'm not gonna read it anymore, <laughs> it's too long, yeah. So ultimately really, and I've been saying this over and over, it's really the connection. It's really the relationship that you're able to forge with your, with your faculty, with the educators that you are working with. That is really, really very important. So really want to emphasize that as you work with your faculty in your institutions. And this is our takeaway so far. I want to highlight the small baby steps for all of you who are thinking of doing this in your institution. You don't have to do it like, like so big and all that. You know, you can start small. You can start with very, very small group of faculty, maybe two, three, and take it from there. You know, and, and really be comfortable with ambiguity. The not yetness. Oh, I love that term. Not yetness. I am not there yet, but I will get there through your help, through your support, through us building this community as we learn together and with each other. So now we talked about educators. How can we serve as connectors to students? Yeah, so I'm so excited to share with you this because as you know, right? So these are our students. These are our MSU students, our associated student government of MSU. And how do you even engage with our students in this, in this environment when they're so stressed, right? They're so stressed. There's a lot of challenges brought about by this pandemic and the online learning. How do you even begin when they're feeling so isolated and, you know, lack connection? Fortunately, again, um, it, it was good because I have already had that connection with our ASMSU um, student government early on when I came on board at MSU. So my first month, I think I asked to be in their agenda for their general assembly. And they gave me like 
maybe 20 minutes. And that was enough for them to, to know and learn that, yes, there is an OER program here on campus. And we really are invested to make it uh, a student success initiative. And it's all for you. And in that meeting, I was able to get two students to be part of our OER uh, program advisory board. So really, really happy because they said, yes, I want to help. And so I said, well, then you become a member of the committee. And they agreed. So again, this is a lot, but I just want to share with you. It really is like this, this, um, what do you call that? Uh, the intersection, like good timing, because uh, Aaron, who's uh, a general assembly representative for the College of Education, was like just doing a research about the cost of higher education and, you know, how can we, um, how can we help you know, re remove this barrier for our students that we are representing in the student government. And so they like Googled OER and they said, and they found my lib guide. And we got, yeah, we have an OER uh, initiative here at MSU and so contacted me. And like, I replied maybe within five minutes and had a meeting, you know, with, with him and, and because I was prepared for this, I was like, how can we help? And I said, well, please create a bill that you can have the student government approve. And so we wrote the bill. I wrote probably 70% of that bill and, um, or let's say 50-50. But this bill really, really is revolutionary. It's four pages. We are setting the stage for 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 um you know for this bit so first of all we are identifying the problem what are the problem so you you see those whereas clause there and then okay i go back so i i put in the problem of inclusive access because that's one that is really you know prevalent now in in college campuses and then they research how much uh money the students are being asked to budget for uh, learning materials. And this is specific to MSU. And then of course, tell them what are OER and what can it enable our, our faculty to do? Yeah, so also give them a little bit of information about the OER program and how much are we uh, impacting or how many students we are impacting in terms of uh, students enrolled in those OER courses. And then look, look at the resolve clause here. There's two resolve clause here. So the first resolve, I put that because I do not want it to come across as we are uh, mandating <laughs> right oh we are used in campus so you can see there when pedagogically appropriate right and then the last resolve is like an aspiration but you know they want to dream big it's like throughout msu undergraduate courses yeah, and so it was unanimously approved. And before this one was approved, I did a 45 minute presentation to the students. They do their meeting in the evening. That was 9.30 p.m. <laughs> 9.30 p.m. to 10.15 p.m. And I am just so glad they were still awake and so excited <laughs> to hear about, uh, you know, this, this partnership. And then so in that meeting, they said, Regina, this is not enough. We want to, to help you more. And we want their VP for financial, uh, we call that VP for financial administration or something said we are prepared to to give you some financial uh, uh, support in order to further your advocacy for OER. So 
So what we did was, you know, I mean, we have a fund. So I have a $50,000 budget every year for faculty incentive only. So that is for our OER award. I, I really want to use the money that they are allocating for OER. So that's 1,500 to be uh, uh, used for advocacy. So what we agreed was, so this one is uh, a leadership award that we awarded to faculty who are using OER and our faculty who got this award, they're so happy to, to receive this coming from our students. So we use that money to, they say, okay, we'll just buy swags. So buy notebooks, buy pens, stickers. And most importantly, OER. So you see there in their initiatives, OER Awareness Week is part of their regular um, in set, uh, project initiatives now. So from this point forward, so I am just like so happy that they took this on. And so this is the, the notebook that I was telling you. They designed this. They had a graphic designer within ASMSU who designed this logo. Very, very Spartan because, you know, Spartan is green, right? Look, look at that. I'm so proud. So that's like the notebook and the pen. And that's Quentin, who's one of the vice presidents um, at ASMSU. So we distributed the swags to the library. They distributed some to the student union and also uh, residential halls. I mean, you know, there's, we don't have that many students on campus, of course, but uh, yeah, we, you know, help them distribute that on campus. So I am almost done. I am almost done. So connecting with students is about meeting them where they are, really. So, you know, in all of the relationships that you are uh, forging on campus, whether it's students or faculty, really important to get to know them. Don't be afraid to ask for help, right? You know, whatever help you might want them to, to provide, whether to help you advocate, whether to help you write a bill or whatever. Make it fun. Let them drive what they want to achieve from like they're, they're helping you and ensure continuity. I think this is important because, um, you know, especially if the, the, the student you're working with is already a senior, right? So yeah, next academic year, that person might not be, right, on, on the, the student government. So it's important for you to, to make sure that the whole student government are in it. And so fortunately, Aaron is a sophomore. So I still have three years <laughs> and, and Quentin, uh, the one that you saw with, with me in the picture is still a sophomore. So he said, well, Regina, as long as I'm here at MSU, we will help you. So that, that, that is really good because you, you need to ensure continuity and make it all about them. And more importantly, listen to their voices and amplify them and speak. Speaking of voices, these are some of our student voices that I want you to hear. And of course, this pertains to cost and how uh, eliminating the barrier of cost, especially in this time when they are learning online is very important. And it's good because we can drill. So this is from the OER feedback survey that we've, um, we've deployed for our student for fall and spring. And we are able to drill deep into the demographics of the students that are impacted by the OER initiative. That's why you can see there, by race, by Pell Grant um, status or Pell eligibility. And I'm sure, you know, the things that our students are saying here is not new. You have heard this many, many times. And this pertains to quality. 
just as good, if not better, than those in my other classes. And then they do not mean words. They tell us how it is. Yeah. So, so really, you know, I, I, I cannot stress the importance of us. We may be straddling in the middle, but we're definitely not neutral, right? We stand at the crossroads between our educators and our students. And we need that partnership in order to advance our initiative. So I stop there. I know there's probably some questions in the chat. If you want to unmute yourself, you can also do that. And yeah, I'll be happy to engage with you. Thanks, Regina. Um, this was wonderful. I have like all kinds of ideas written down here. Um, so uh, we have a question here from Ben. Ben. What, what mix of librarians slash instructional designers slash other support positions versus teaching faculty do you have in your learning communities? Do you have any administrators? No, we don't because these are people who are actively engaging. So, so I facilitate it. So I'm a librarian and my co-facilitator, Andy, who is our digital scholarship librarian. So we are the only two librarians here because really this learning community is all about the faculty who are teaching with OER because what we want to achieve is that trans continuity between resources and practice. Because that's the only way that you can um, ensure that it continues on and becomes sustainable. Because it, it's, it's not just replacing, right? A textbook with an OER. It also entails change in the way you teach, in the way you interact with students in your pedagogy. And that is what we hope to achieve with the community from resources to practice. So yeah, so it's mostly faculty. And we have uh, one instructional designer who, who, uh, who also teaches in the summer for uh, uh, an online program who is part of the, the community. Did that answer your question, Ben? Yeah. Okay. Perfectly. Thanks. Thank you. I, I'm not looking at the chat, so I rely on you, Mandy, too. I've, I've got Anything? it covered. I had I had a quick question that I'm gonna sneak in just myself. Um, <laughs> I, really, I really liked what you said about um, making connections and building relationships with faculty. And it's so hard when we're all like online. And so I just wondered if you had any strategies for, and also with students for how to do that kind of outreach in kind of this weird pandemic environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of Zoom meetings. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard, but I see it as if you have done at least a bit of that work prior to us moving online, then it becomes a little easier, right? And, and the thing is, I am very cognizant of the fact that our faculty are stretched too, you know? So a lot of the, the, the things or the connections that I've had the fortune to have, like during this pandemic, are really the faculty who are, uh, actively doing their OER projects. So you are OER um, awardees. And, and it's so funny because we've seen an uptake with regards to OER adoptions from faculty whom I have never even talked to. <laughs> so they just like, oh, you know, they've just seen the value of, of using OER and I track. I track our OER adoptions. So 
uh, I have that access to the registers office portal, um, our bookstore portal that has the adoptions. So I am able to track uh, adoptions of, of OER. So for, for spring um, semester, we had, we have about 27, uh, 27 courses using OER. Wow. We are, I will say we are over our time. So if anyone does need to go, please um, just know we're thankful for you being here and uh, this the recording will be available later. Regina, are you okay answering another yeah, question? Yeah, okay. sure. <laughs> Um, it's not Heather, like we're going anywhere, so yes. Right. <laughs> um, so Heather asked, mm -hmm. what are some of the fun open pedagogy assignments instructors have done on your campus? Oh, so, so for this, this uh, academic year, we, we are learning some of the things that might be possible for their classes. So, you know, we, we use DS-106 assignment bank, we use the open pedagogy notebook, uh, we use the equity and bound. That is really a good place for you to uh, take a look at online student engagement. One of the things that really I am very proud of, so this is one of our faculty participants in the learning community, they, she teaches um, integrated arts and humanities um, class from our writing, rhetoric, uh, and composition department. And uh, she, she had her students wrote the textbook, the textbook, you know, the learning material for the class. And the class is about hookup culture. And so, you know, in the in the list of titles that I have shown you in there, if you go to MSU Press Books Publishing, you can see that there. It's an example, the first, the first of our student authored uh, OER. So that one is a, an, an exempt, exemplar. So a lot of our faculty are, you know, doing baby steps. Like, will you please critically read through the OER that I've, I've, uh, <laughs> I've written and tell me about what, what is in there that sucks? <laughs> or, I mean, probably not that way, but <laughs> You know, what is it in there that you find confusing or not that clear or what might be some of the changes that I can incorporate to make your uh, engagement and understanding better. So, and, and when she gets that feedback, she automatically uh, reviews, revise that, that OER and voila, it's there. So yeah, those are great examples. Thank you to Cheryl for putting links in the chat, <laughs> as she often does. Um, so, are there any last questions before we wrap up? Oh, Deidre, are you doing peer review of your books that you're publishing? We do not have a, a systematic way of peer reviewing yet. That is in my to-do. But the faculty who complete, completed our uh, OER project certainly had their uh, colleagues, faculty colleagues, read through them and provide feedback. I hope to provide uh, a more incentivized way by which our faculty can engage in in peer reviewing each other's work because we are an institutional member of open uh, education network so that's oen and we when i started at msu we provided 
incentives for our faculty to review uh, textbooks at the Open Textbooks Library. And we paid them $350 to do a review. Yeah, I, I kind of like upped it up a bit <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to make them, to make it more enticing for them to review. And we had 23 faculty who did reviews for uh, OTL. And I want to do that too when with with risk with regards to a peer review. Okay, I think we'll wrap up here. Um, everyone, please join me in thanking Regina for a wonderful talk, very inspiring, lots of great ideas. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just wanted to quickly announce as you're leaving that our raffle winner for our social channel this year is Cliff Maslowski. Ooh. Cliff, I think I saw you here. We'll follow up with you yeah. later. And please, please, please uh, fill out our post event survey that we'll be sending out shortly. Uh, thank you all so much for coming and we'll see you at next year's event. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Regina.